If you have any questions or concerns about this week's episode, please call or text producer Dan at 778-288-9255. Start the party, Dan. It's time to turn it up. We're getting crazy, going wild, fucking nasty stuff. Dude scrolling down, like a fun stuff. Fire, boom, roast, mad post, sticking up the replies. We don't want to go to school. We don't want to get a job. We just want to get online and get our ass fucked. We don't follow the rules. We do whatever we want. It's fuck party, the podcast, like we're food in the duck. Hello, friends, idiots, and friends who are also idiots. Welcome to your favorite podcast about social media and rejection. It is Blocked Party. This is episode number 258. I'm John. I'm Stefan. And with us is a great guest this week. Fantastic guest. Uh, a very funny comedian, as well as the host of the George Lucas talk show, as well as the host of Dead Eyes and featured on the In the Cards podcast. Connor Ratliff is here. Hi, Connor. Hi, Connor. Uh, hello. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. I mean, this is this is uh, great for me not to like uh, not to like blow up your spot or whatever. But uh, I am a big dead eyes head, a big dead head, which I believe is what you call your fans. Uh, yes, we're trying. We're trying to take that away. <laughs> we, we feel like we can claim that we have a big following and we'll, we'll set up that conflict with the Grateful Dead fans. Yeah. Uh, why, why not? I mean, yeah, we've, I, I, we've sort of worked on like I, I think we tried blockheads for a while and that yeah. sort of like fell off and and now i mean it's just kind of like hogs or like little piggies i think is sort of what we settled on but yeah um deadheads is nice i mean that's yeah i think there's something to I, that. Think, I think some people were trying to get eye heads started mm, okay. and not wanting to uh but i don't i don't know it's it, it, it's it is hard to fight with the legacy of the grateful dead we we are a popular podcast but we don't have people that follow us around from town to town you don't, you don't know that you don't know that you need to get the dead eyes tour going and then you could see we have, it's true it's, scientifically we have not tested it <laughs> I, I, I i was i was that was rash of me to definitively <laughs> declare that we don't have people who follow us from town to town i'm just not aware of it i'm pretty sure you could definitely get john mayer involved uh because he does all the de the grateful dead stuff now right that they do the dead and company things so yeah. you could do you know i think john mayer he's always around you get him you get whoever i don't know who the other dead and company people are but you get them rolling i mean i think i think you could be onto something here yeah i we i haven't done enough to test this out yeah and that's well, my fault that's okay and that's you that's should fine. do it i mean i listened to the episode where you guys did you were in like belgium or something was that yes, right we did go to belgium uh that was sort of a a at the after season three we flew to belgium for this uh podcast uh convention where we, we did the me and my two of my producers uh, we did a keynote speech uh, and then people asked us very serious questions about podcasting so that's kind of the start that's like tour date number one now it we'll really see is. how many of these belgians follow you stateside yeah people were very curious i have to say it was a there was response. a lot of questions there were people yeah. were very dialed in yeah and they wanted to know the secrets they wanted to know how we do it <laughs> <laughs> you're like well i don't uh, know we sit down and talk mostly we ju we just start jamming and we see what happens very much like the grateful dead <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 so i am i'm starting to see this more clearly how this is possible that we could our, our fan base could claim that label if we just try a little bit harder we got to put in the hours and the miles yes yes that's the key or, or the kilometers if we're if wow we're, Th and you know. thank you for thank that. you that so very, much did they even tell you that we were canadian or did you just sort of backwards reverse engineer that no, I know, no i've heard of the podcast i know you're i know you're canadian and i would have anyway <laughs> <laughs> what about us is yeah. giving is giving you a canadian uh, you, feel you just you just did it right there in the sentence i can hear it you know <laughs> Okay, I got. Well, you a did say bit about there, I guess, right? So that oh, is sort did you of, say about? Yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't the it wasn't the full thing, but there's just that little touch. That's just a little touch in that word that is a is a telltale. Yeah, sign. the big Damn. one. The big one for me that um, I didn't realize uh, until up to like a few years ago that there's like a non Canadian way of saying this, but uh, the word is spelled D E C A L. And do, do you know how we say it up here in Canada? You said decal. Oh no. No, we no, say, no, no. No. No, not even that. <laughs> we we in fact we say decal. Decal? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I I would not have been prepared for that. It might have thrown me maybe it's somewhere maybe you're from somewhere else. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It it's um 
It's something that Tickle. yeah, people it pisses get, people off. People That's like really the one that pisses people it. off the most. I think yeah. people kind of think oh. like about and sorry. I think they think are kind yeah. of like cute regionalisms, but Deckel they get they get they pissed get off. infuriated. Yeah. I would never be angry about. It. Well, people shouldn't be angry about it because <laughs> first of all, uh, I mean now I'm questioning how I even say it because it's not a <laughs> word. It's not a word that comes up often no. enough. No. Yeah, uh, nine times out of ten, I'm gonna say sticker. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of only like when you're talking about a car. I think is well, really only, where you get for the... me. The only time it came up was on my Twitch stream with with Jesse Ferrar, where I had a a huge decal made up of him uh, to put behind us right. during the stream because because he's in Nashville and I'm I'm in, I was in L.A. at the time, but uh, and and so I was like so excited to reveal it to him and to the stream. And then it was totally overshadowed by me saying Deckel. So they just didn't even care about it's, it. But I was, yeah. It, it's, I think it's charming. I, I'm going to call out the outrage. I'm going to say that, that whether, I think that that's faux outrage. I don't think people are really angry, but I think people, it doesn't take much for them to feel like their faux outrage or their bit outrage is real rage. It can become mm-hmm. real outrage pretty quick. You can, you can be ironically angry and then it just. And then, then you like dig into it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you must Deco have had... is a dumb way of saying that, and they, they do get very pissed off. But yeah, I was gonna say like with Dead Eyes though. I mean, it was such a huge pot. I mean, you must have had people fake mad at you for a bunch of shit. Um. Well, people. Uh, I was afraid that people would be mad about it. We, we were worked very hard to make it clear right up at the top that this wasn't me uh, trying to be negative about Tom Hanks. And there was the period where I almost quit the podcast uh, at, at the start of the pandemic when Tom and Rita were the first like high profile people to get COVID. Right. And I yeah. genuinely thought we'd only had like a handful of episodes out at that point. And I genuinely thought, oh, no, if something happens to him now, <laughs> people will turn to see like who is the last person who was cruel to this man. <laughs> and I thought, I'm going to be, people are going to, we're going to have to take, we're going to have to scrub the internet of the episodes one through five because <laughs> it was just going to be like uh, terrible. And I thought, we're done. No one's going to be in the mood to hear anything I have to say from this point on. Um, and then there were, then there was a period, ironically, like when we got to the end of season three and we, and I talked to Tom Hanks that was a lot of people uh that was a moment a lot of people heard about the podcast for the first time and in a in a really almost too big a way i was like actually uncomfortable with the amount of people who were like paying attention all at once and what you learn and i knew i was aware of this from just observing other phenomena that get big is once you can have like a thousand fans and they're they're all really nice but you have 10,000 fans, you start to get more people who aren't nice or who were like mad at the thing. Yeah. And as soon as people heard like, Oh, there's, there's this podcast where this guy's like coming for Tom Hanks, it's coming after him. And there suddenly were people who were just hearing the, it's like the people who read the headline of the article and immediately go to like, I got comments to make. And then the comments just become a, a back and forth of like, you didn't read the article and, and other people who were mad about the headline. There were people who were just like, this guy has spent the last 20 years obsessing about this and they were really like mad about it. And it yeah. was just, it was people who see a headline that really gives the impression that I had done nothing for two decades, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but stew, <laughs> but few over this and wait for a format to arrive in which I could, uh, uh explore it. Now, did you, you ever know. get involved with, or not involved, but did anyone ever contact you like on, on Twitter, especially like, there's like the QAnon psychos who think Tom Hanks has been taken away by like a military tribunal. Like, did did they ever get involved or get in your mentions? Yeah, uh, not a lot, but people who are like searching for uh, famous people's names that they can uh, expound uh, upon their their crackpot theories. Yeah. And uh, there are a few like if in the I'll sometimes get like an email that will update me as far as like, um, oh, here's the reviews that are happening for your podcast. And I'll sort of scan, scan through to see. And they're mostly five star reviews. And every now and then there's a one star review. And it's almost always not about the podcast. It's one of those like conspiracy theorists who's just going looking <laughs> for anything having to do with Tom Hanks to give it one star. And 
uh it's it's usually that is like an instant block for me that like any the second anyone is quoting QAnon stuff it's like uh, i just don't want to give it any oxygen you know yeah it's yeah. a follow yeah. it's a follow for me i am uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm right i'm right i just want to be dialed in you you know yeah I mean? of course yeah what's happening what are they talking about what are they talking about you yeah. know it's uh, what who's what being pizza executed shop right is uh, yeah. is a sex trafficking place these yeah. days you yeah. know or whatever we sort of solve that issue by never having 10,000 fans. That's kind of how we, we, we curate this podcast very specifically to cap at 999. Yeah. 9,999. Yeah. That, in some ways, that's been the approach with the George Lucas talk show, which is that we, from the beginning, have always sort of uh, uh, avoided putting it in a, in, into any system where it would get a huge amount of attention because we don't want to draw too many Star Wars fans. To yeah. It. Oh yeah. my god, because yeah. That could be a nightmare. We've been very lucky. We have a, a pretty good fan base, but we don't uh Star Wars fans generally have not like uh been attracted to it. They they see that it's fake and they're like, "No, I want to be mad about the real Star Wars." And I'll like turn around and Yeah. Uh and so we don't have a lot of um we don't have a lot of angry Star Wars boys in our uh, uh it, following. That feels lucky to me that you don't. It's been, yeah. Um I think because we don't talk about Star Wars that much, you start talking about Radio Land murders for five minutes, and all the Star Wars people leave <laughs> yeah. the room. It's it's the, it's actually the cure. It's actually the cure, I think, for the Star Wars fandom is start talking about almost any other Lucasfilm project. Yeah, and they're just in. It's it's you talk about American Graffiti or more American Graffiti for more than a few minutes, and people just uh, leave the room, and they're like, "I I came here to be angry about." Uh, female characters in star wars and uh there's nothing for me here yeah yeah no one here is a you know? mary sue which is a concept that drives me absolutely insane for some reason like what is that i don't think i know what that is i believe the idea behind it is uh it's a female character who is just like really good at everything right away without having to try but it's like that's kind of just like what Anyway, I don't want to get into the fucking Star Wars discourse, but it's, yeah, it's just yeah. insane. Steph, it's just I mis- actually prefer you get into the Star Wars discourse, no, please. No, it's just, I mean, it's just like misogynist Star Wars fans yeah, who hate women. Where, it's, a, it's that thing where you hold um, Ray from Star Wars to a higher standard than you would have held Luke. Yes. Where it's sort of like, no one was like, how'd Luke get so good at being a Jedi? He was a moisture farmer. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't, suddenly the people no longer accept uh they they sort of pick and choose which parts of the uh space fantasy are uh plausible yes because then they're also mad i guess i am getting into the star wars just get into but, it baby but then they are also mad for luke being like a flawed character in the last jedi which is so it's kind of like they wanted they're just mad about everything um, well that i have a theory about that which just has to do with a lot of the the, the angriest people about that were people who uh are roughly the same age or have gone through the same life experience. And they really didn't like see They were hoping to see like uh, a reflection and be able to think like, I'm, I'm like this. And what they saw was a reflection <laughs> of actual disappointment. A lot of, a lot of dudes who are really mad about this are people who have been through the same kind kind of feeling of like they're divorced. They don't have custody, et cetera. You know, it's sort of one of those things where they looked at it and they're like, Oh shit. Like this is actually, uh, he went through a, 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 a lifetime of, you know, big disappointments, just like me. And I don't like that. And that's not why I go see space operas. Right. Right. The they want the guy to be a hero. They're not looking for some sort of like tragic flaw or something. They don't want to think about yeah. their own tragedy. Yeah. I think one of the, one of the things about, you know, when we do the George Lucas talk show, we tend to, um, it, which I should explain is a, a comedy show where I pretend to be retired filmmaker George Lucas, but we've spent just as much time talking about like any other topic that comes up, yeah. uh, including like his obsession with like Norman Rockwell paintings and the big museum he's building in LA. And like, that is the, to me where the fun of it is, is to actually, we're more about like creating this weird sort of gonzo version of this, um, wildly successful billionaire filmmaker philanthropist uh, philanthropist sorry i said that word i approached that word completely wrong and then it came out <laughs> honestly that's probably how we say it up here yeah so that was sort of like a, that felt like a british approach yeah. for sure i started to say philanthropic and then i pivoted halfway through the word and i realized <laughs> yeah. now i sound stupid <laughs> um then you and, fit right in here don't worry about that and part of the, the fun of it is that george lucas is someone who 
is so successful that even though uh, he's had so many huge high profile failures, like most of his movies have gotten like terrible reviews. And uh, even when he like infuriates the majority of the audience going to a movie, it still becomes like a movie you can't ignore that like breaks records and changes the way movies are made. And it's just like the guy, even when he makes a flop, it'll be like, Oh, it's the first Marvel movie. You know, yeah, like, right. how are the doc? You'd be like, even that is like a footnote to like the, the, one of the most successful franchises ever made. It's like, well, this was the first attempt. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, but it keeps the, it keeps the trolls away. If you can, um, not, uh, like even with, even with dead eyes, I think we didn't attract a huge percentage of that because there's a, a fundamental like empathy at the core of both George Lucas talk show and dead eyes that is repellent to people who want to fight. You know, <laughs> they come into the room and they're like, everyone's, everyone's getting along and having a good time as any, And if you don't fight back, it's sort of like, oh, okay, well, I guess I'll go somewhere else where we can actually get some traction where we can with, fight about this. Yeah, yeah. I'll go back to, I'll go yeah. back to Twitter. My, yeah, my, I guess people miss the sort of point that it's the George Lucas talk show and not the star Wars talk show. They just assume uh, George Lucas equals star Wars. They, yeah. you know, it, it start. Well, that's one of the reasons why we never made it a podcast is because I knew that, um, if it's an audio format, it might just, it's easier to make the mistake of I'm searching for it. I discover it. Oh, George Lucas has a podcast, which is a thing <laughs> one could imagine happening. Whereas when we started doing the show, it was a $5 midnight show at the upright citizens, upright citizens brigade theater in the East village. And there were a handful of times where people would show up thinking it was George Lucas, but I never felt bad about it because I was like, you showed up at like 1155 on a Friday night <laughs> to a $5 show in a, in a 150 seat theater yeah. and with starring George Lucas. And you thought there would be tickets. Like, yeah, yeah. You'd like, you could walk up. Yeah. Yeah. I could like just walk George, up and go to this. No problem. <laughs> They announced that George Lucas was going to be at Comic Con next year. The line would start now. Yeah, you know, like the, and so like people were like, oh, every now and then we'd hear from the box office. Yeah, like a couple of people showed up. They were really upset when they found out it was <laughs> just someone for. I want to meet like, these people. I oh want to meet God, these baby so brain good. people. It's that's so beautiful. So I love that. It's just so I, I. I feel like we have to have signifiers in a visual medium. It's obvious that I sprayed up my uh, uh hair and yeah. beard with and it's a, not a, the real a, lotto you know <laughs> yes you see it, it, the the trick of us using a purely analog watto meaning griffin newman in a in a skin tight bodysuit wearing an elephant <laughs> trunk for a nose you, it's a, even for a novice it's immediately apparent that this is either not cgi or it's cgi at a level we have yet to see <laughs> It's the best CGI <laughs> like the of best all time. It's, yeah. it's so it's had. so real that it baff, it baffles our perception of what a, what could be accomplished with digital effects. Yeah, oh, even man. today. My my favorite uh, George Lucas thing was there. I think it was the Force Unleashed, uh, that Star Wars video game. And I'm sure you've you've read this anecdote, but the names he came up with for the uh, John, have you heard this? Yeah. No, I mean, definitely not. I mean, I, I think it's probably important to give Connor the context that the only Star Wars movie I've ever seen is Phantom Menace. Yeah, and that is genuinely uh, true. And that's <laughs> genuinely true. And I haven't seen any of the shows, The Mandalorian, whatever else. I've seen nothing. So yeah, Phantom Menace right. is the only Star Wars content I've ever engaged with. But I do have a story it? about Phantom Menace I want to tell, but I want Stefan to do this thing first. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, Connor, you, you know this, but John, um, there was a video game called The Force Unleashed, and I, I think the main character... Let me see. What era of video game is this? I want to say it was like 2007, 2008, around that. So like PS2? It was or like 3? 360. Like, I think okay. it was because I think it was going to be like a Kinect game or something as well. They wanted to have like oh, motion okay. controls for sure. But anyway, um, they they asked George Lucas for some name suggestions for uh, for the villain, I think. And, and they wanted to do um, they wanted to have Darth as like the title. Right. So you have Darth Vader, Darth Maul. Um, and the two titles that he suggested, and these are real, uh, Darth Icky and Darth Insanius. 
I mean, Darth Insanius is a great name for a backup rapper in Cypress Hill. But but all but also some of those like names kind of did make it into the the prequels at least, right? Like you have the guy like the guy who sells the death sticks or whatever. His name is like Sleaze Bagano or something. Um, so you you do get those like George Lucas prequel style names in in the movies. But uh, yeah, I, Darth Icky and Darth Insanius are so funny to me every single time. Yeah, I mean, it, it is one of the craziest things. I've been I've been overall pretty impressed. Like, I'm not a hardcore Star Wars fan by the definition that I think hardcore Star Wars fans would... Like, I think I'd be kicked out of the club. I don't remember the names of the robots. And I, you know, there's just so many things. I'm like, oh, yeah, that did happen. Um, but I've been overall impressed with the Disney era Star Wars stuff. I think the acting is better in most of if not all of the disney era star wars things they just get really good actors who commit really hard to um in most cases better dialogue like what you we can debate like forever you know which ones like are better than others but overall there's been like a prioritization of human behavior and things that were not there in the lucas era where he had different kind of priorities and people forget like the people who are mad about the Disney era ones, they forget how, all the things that happened that m- they would not have liked during the era when George was in charge. One of the things that it's from a movie I haven't seen from after the prequels, they did an animated star Wars movie. That was the clone wars. that was yeah. like a theatrical movie. I've never seen it. <clears throat> and uh, it was one of the things that caught me by surprise when I was doing the show and I, learned something I did not know, which I feel like should be a more famous fact, which is the name of Jabba the Hutt's son. Yeah, first of all, he has a son. He has a son. <laughs> okay. There's a plot line I think has to do with him getting kidnapped. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I was learning this while pretending to be George Lucas in one of our early shows. <laughs> and I lost it. I absolutely lost it because it sounds like something I would make up that the name of Jabba the Hutt's son, or the the nickname, but the name of his son is Stinky. And <laughs> Come on, Stinky the Hutt. His, Stinky I, I the his, Hutt. His, his, I guess his proper name, his uh, his proper name is Rata. Okay, I don't know if, if I'm pronouncing that right, but they call him Stinky. Oh. So Stinky the Hutt gets kidnapped, and Jabba the Hutt's like, my son, my son, <laughs> and. and like how can you have a complaint about anything that anyone ever does with this yeah. franchise like you either like it or you don't but like this is this is the world there's a lot of good things about it there's a lot of terrible things about it it is just i don't think people have enough fun with it's like people getting mad at deckel you know yeah. like yeah i almost want to redefine the word deckel to have a, a second meaning everyone pronounces it deckel this meaning and to decal is to become angry about something that should be a source of delight. <laughs> yes, I like that. Like, yeah. But don't, don't, don't decal this. <laughs> don't. You're. I think you're deckling right you're now. Deckling. Uh, what, you're what, being a real deckler de- right now. You're. You're. Yeah. You're being a deckler. You're deckling. Don't decal. <laughs> to decal is to become genuinely outraged at something that should be funny to you. Even if, you can not like something and it be funny to you. That is actually the ideal pop culture response to something that's like, Oh, I don't care for this. Yeah. It was my, it was my immediate res- immediate response to anything I didn't like in the prequels. When I, when I saw Phantom Menace in the theater, there were so many things that I, there were things I liked, but there were so many things I didn't like. And they were all funny to me because I'm like, it's just not for me. You know, like I am, I'm a, gr- at that point I was a grown man. Yeah. It's for kids. And I'm just, I mean, it is for kids. And I'm just like, just like imagine <laughs> going into a, a candy store and trying some of the new candy and being like, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> just being f- a furious grown man storming around the store. just like, where are the M&Ms? That's the only candy I like. This new candy is disgusting. It's just like, it's not made for you, man. Yeah. Like, you should be eating vegetables and taking care of yourself. To be clear, trying, I think John would not to die. John would do that. In a uh, candy yeah, the new candies they've come out with these days are just <laughs> absurd. Uh, yeah, well, we, uh, <laughs> Becca and I, uh, we were at a, a drugstore, like a general store the other day, 
and that Jello has like a new type of candy. It's like a, they they kind of kind of looks like they're doing like a rip off Mike and Ike. Like it's the, they're okay. like the shape of Mike and Ikes, but they're supposed to be like Jello flavors, and they're made by Jello. Interesting. And huh? they were really bad. And oh. Becca and I were, and I was like, I paid, I paid three dollars for this <laughs> box. Like I, no, I didn't actually yell, but it was like, ah, oh, fuck, this candy sucks. <laughs> Do you th- are there people? Have you looked around to see? Are there people who like the new Jello candy? Oh, that's a good that's a good point. I haven't actually. I didn't even look it up. So this one, I'm gonna look it up. I'm gonna see if I can find. Yeah, it's it called the Jello nice Super Mix. Is it, the uh, is the candy we just? It had. is fun to look up. Like if there's something that you really like or really don't like, it is fun to look up kind of the general like tenor on the internet uh, towards it. Because like for instance, John and I both play the EA Sports NHL video game a lot. Uh, yeah. and it's been kind of notoriously going downhill for a little while now, but the new one 24 just came out a couple weeks ago and I'm really enjoying it. John, you haven't played it yet, but no. it is, it is quite fun. They've made a bunch of changes, but if you go to like the subreddit, it's just people who are so mad and so enraged and asking for refunds. And it's just like, are we playing the same game here? Like, I don't know. Where it's also like, you know is. what to expect. It comes out every year. Yeah. And it's, and, and it's kind of the, the same, same thing with the jello candies. It's like, I didn't like them, but they're still like a little sugar bomb. Like I'll yeah. still eat that. It's not sure. like it's, it's not like you put a candy in your mouth unless it's licorice. It's not like you put a candy in your mouth often and you're like, well, this is not even edible. Like yeah. you're, you, it might not be as good as your favorite candies, but like it's going to, you're going to get to the same place probably. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Now, what was it? What what kind of candy were these? I'm it's seeing called some Jello, Jello Super Mix. Jello Super Mix candy. Yeah, okay. I was trying to look so for all, reviews. I couldn't find any. I've already discovered Jello candies. I I didn't think possible. There's one that was a pudding cup candy. There's a milk chocolate pudding cup candy and some oh. Jello gummies. Uh, and I'm looking to see what these people are saying about them. These are not the candies you found, but I'm already, I've already, okay, you're, already in the, you're already in the jello candy, <laughs> the JCU. <laughs> I will say yeah, there are several YouTube videos reviewing jello super mix, which is not, that's not a surprise. Um, right. In fact, I'm looking, I searched jello super mix review and one of the first results, and this is how <sighs> Connor, I'm really obsessed with, um, there's a fast food review guy, uh, his channel is called peep this out and he's like a complete like empty shell and he's been doing this for like 10 years and he'll review fast food and snacks and stuff in his car and he has just this insane patter and it's he's just a really strange guy but the level of obsessed I am with him is that I just looked up jello super mix review and the third video result is from someone who is like in his like it's one of his patrons and someone who's like in his like chat live streams that i recognize from there that's how deep i am into <laughs> that's it. sad yeah that is actually quite sad it's not good yeah <laughs> yeah i i, I don't want to i don't want to waste your time going into and exploring videos now that of people but i will say that the reddit the subreddit um in for candy yeah where they're discussing the milk chocolate jello pudding cups unwrapped candies and the uh berry blue strawberry jello gummies um, there's a, a great diversity of opinion. Okay. okay. Uh, the first, uh, so this is, bear in mind, this is from a year ago. So okay. things could have changed. A lot, yeah. A lot may have changed. Someone says, I tried the pudding cups. They are a cheap tasting chocolate candy, but if you like jello pudding, they are spot on. In other words, I ate the whole bag. Okay. <laughs> That's nice. All right. A little self deprecating. Nice. That's yeah. fun. Yeah. And then, and then they say like, my wife didn't like them, but she doesn't really like chocolate jello pudding. So it really depends on your personal enjoyment factor. Okay. They wow. do taste cheap, but they also <laughs> taste like chocolate jello pudding. So it worked out for me. And then they start laughing out loud. Yeah. I, I guess <laughs> they're out for me <laughs> there. It's funny uh, seeing them sort of <laughs> gradually come to the re- realization. Like it tastes cheap. Oh, I guess jello chocolate pudding is cheap is what's happening here. Yes. Yeah. It's like, it's like they don't taste fancy and expensive, like regular jello <laughs> yeah. <chocolate> pudding. <laughs> yeah. I'm Which used to a like, sort of Cadillac experience yeah. when I'm eating a yes. Jello product. They taste like luxury, you know. Yeah. Someone else says, "Yeah, they've been at my Kroger for about a year." Dot dot dot. Boyfriend said they were blah. Oh wow! <laughs> so this, so this person's just trusting their boyfriend's opinion, not even going to try them. Right. A year. This is now. This is. They're saying this is a year ago. So that's two years two ago years in ago, our wow. timeline. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Then someone says. Um, yes, I have tried both. Gummies were not good, but the pudding cups were all right. Just tasted like cheap candy. 
<laughs> and someone enters the discussion and says, probably a dumb question, but are the pudding cups filled with pudding or chocolate? That, that is interesting because it could it have does, some sort yeah. of like if it could be filled it, with yeah like i'm trying to figure it out like Connor. is it almost. like a chocolate that's supposed to taste like the pudding is that what the it lo- i don't know it, like it, it almost looks, looks like a me, chocolate coin or something like that type to me of, it looks like imagine uh there's like a it looks like there's like it's hard to tell because the photograph is a little bit distorted by the shape of the wrapper but it looks to me like you're seeing a cross section like it's cut open and you're seeing like the like oh. a Reese's it, it does sort of, sort of look like a, a Reese's cup a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they give the answer to this though. And they say, um, well, as to whether it's pudding or chocolate inside, say, well, sort of tastes like pudding, but definitely does not taste like jello pudding. It's okay. more like just a generic chocolate filling. They tried, I guess. Just my opinion. <laughs> They tried, I guess. I mean, that's that was a very like uh, healthy, is, healthy online so, discussion, especially leaving yeah. room for other people's opinions. Yeah. You don't usually get that online. Like a lot, there was a lot of your mileage may vary type of uh, which usually you just get like, I tried this, it fucking sucks. Don't ever have it in your whole life. I guess the candy <laughs> subreddit is like pretty. They're pretty polite. I- well, I mean, here's the thing. Like, you got a lot of uh, diversity of, of experience and opinion here because another guy chimes in with what I think is a useless uh, contribution. He says, saw them at Rocket Fizz last week, but didn't buy them. <laughs> Great. Now, I guess it's, I guess it's useful. <laughs> it's, still got some, it's still got some useful if you know what or where Rocket Fizz is. Right. Given right. a consumer tip, that's where you can go. So even that, not completely useless. I was too harsh. Then someone says, haven't but they look tasty i think especially the chocolate with pudding filling that has to be good has to be Optim- okay optimism optimism i i will say I'm, oh. I'm i'm on the candy subreddit i've sorted it by top all-time posts and the top post and i do think this is actually kind of a good idea uh and it's my astonishingly dumb idea for a new reese's pieces and it's one giant piece so it's just reese's piece and, and it says on the bag it's just one giant piece eat it like an apple and you know what? <laughs> that was not how I was picturing it. No. I was picturing it more like a big well, disc. It is a big disc, not I think. Like but a... I think the idea is you take an, a bite out of it, and it's sort of like an <laughs> apple-shaped bite. But it's not bad. I always felt like fun size was a bad name for the individual small ones. That yeah. fun size should be the really big. Like you put your face yes. in. It. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I fun. agree. Not yeah. snack I, snack size, maybe for the small one or whatever. Yeah. I, I do think overall, I like the fact that I think there's some deckling I'm noticing uh, within the candy <laughs> subreddit about candy corn. I think people deckle about candy corn oh, a lot. People are always yeah. deckling about candy corn. I like, you know what? I like candy corn. I know it's, it's fine. like, it's, I, I'm not going to go out of my way, but I'll have it. I, I don't understand. The, well, for me, the candy that I like, and again, maybe this is a Canadian thing or just like a Commonwealth country thing, but the I Mandy do. Mandy Moore I, album. I, well, yeah, I do like black licorice. And yeah. I, that's a thing. I understand people being enraged at Terrible. that. Terrible. So you're walking around Bulk Barn, and you're getting uh, some candy corn. You're getting some black licorice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are, are you impressed that I dropped that? That, uh, that was crazy. That was really good. The Bulk Barn reference? That was really good. Wow. Yeah. Bulk Barn, for people who don't know, my one trip to Canada, the thing I think about constantly, because Bulk Barn blew my mind, because at first I thought it was just one place. It was kind of amazing. No. And when I realized it was a popular chain, yep. I could not believe it. It also seems um, blissfully like a pre-COVID because it's entirely a, a yeah. pre-pandemic. Oh, yeah. place. It's all pick and mix. And yeah. they never went, they, they never went uh, woke. They were just like, yeah. uh, they were just oh, no. like, uh, no, yeah. not in like a bad way. <laughs> just in a like, no, this, this is what we do and There's we're no just going to keep change. doing it. There is no way to change what they no. were. I'm, yeah. I'm just, uh, uh, the, there really isn't a a pandemic safe version of no. pick and mix that doesn't ruin the experience. <laughs> you would need you would ruin them financially having to put in sort of like um, hydraulic like shoots that would sort of like <laughs> yeah. suck the candy out for or you. Or like when they're when they're you're dealing with like nuclear materials or whatever, and you go like those like tubes that you put your arms with in the big, the big tongs and yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, that wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. They, they they wouldn't have the money for that. I don't. No, think. I don't but think so. No, Bulk Barn is definitely uh, one of my favorite places. Yeah, I mean, go. black licorice, and this this is another very Canadian thing. And I feel like I I don't think John likes this, but they're my. I don't like black licorice. No, but but one of my favorite ice cream flavors, and this is no. A, don't even say it. 
I love it. This is a Canadian. No, you don't. I do. Oh, Stefan. This is a Canadian specific ice cream flavor. Um, oh. It's sort of the ice cream equivalent of Hawaiian pizza, which was also invented in Canada. Um, but it's called Tiger ice cream, and it's like orange and black licorice. And yeah, it's orange ice cream with a yeah. black licorice ribbon. It's so it's good. Tiger tail. Usually. I, I love it. It's it's really, really good. But again, it's, it's another disgusting. one of those things where it's even disgusting. even other Canadians will. It's not a thing that Canada is proud of. I will say, <laughs> but it's good. It's, it's not. Nice. It's not. I good. like it. It's, it's good. Not good. Would you try it, Connor? I, do you think? I might try it. Okay. Do you, you like do, black it, licorice? Yeah. I like black licorice. licorice so that's not a doesn't have. It, there are certain things that are a no go zone. If you're like it's candy, but it tastes like an onion or something, I'd be like, <laughs> I'm not even going to try it. You just yeah. Don't need to tell me twice, you know. But black licorice, I, I, I do like it. Not in. Like I wouldn't if someone I wouldn't eat a black licorice candy like an apple if it was something like that. Right. Right. That's, I have a trick for um candy that I don't buy, but you occasionally find it's like the candy that's there in some contexts, which is Twizzlers. Yeah. Yep. Um, I don't think they're a great candy, but when they're around and I'll try them, I do a mental trick, which is uh, which is it's crazy because it's not like it's broccoli where it's like you need Twizzlers in your diet. So you <laughs> yeah. should find a workaround so you can eat these. But I will pretend it is like either can- it's either instead of candy, it's it is either a candle or soap. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if you eat a Twizzler and you're like pretend that you just picked a candle out of a out of like a, a candle holder, and you start eating. You're like, oh, man, this, this is actually can- this tastes <laughs> really good for like. Uh, a, a bar of soap or a candle. <laughs> is... you're sort of like it, it, you're like it's actually really good. I pr- I hope I don't get sick from this. You know, <laughs> I I do remember as a kid once being so hungry. I was at like I was at like a public pool or something, and I was so hungry. And for whatever reason, like the lost and found was right there, and someone had left a um like L'Oreal like kids shampoo like watermelon like not flavor as I smelling. was soon to learn, exactly. but it smelled like it. And I was like, I'm really, I'll take, I'll just taste a little bit of the, the watermelon shampoo. And I was, I mean, it tastes like it tastes really bad. It tastes quite bad. <laughs> <laughs> so I wish this was your, your YouTube review channel. Like, God, I mean, I, this watermelon shampoo tastes really bad. I also famously, <laughs> I also famously ate uh, like dry cat food as a kid. I would sneak out of my bed at night and, and, eat cat food famously i yeah. famously that's, did this that's at least that's at least food it was yeah i mean it was like i'd I rather like i'd rather food. if you're like would you re- would you eat this cat food or would you eat, drink this shampoo yeah i go with the cat food that's every time cat food for sure yeah no question i do well i do want to quickly go back to one star wars thing which is oh that, i i still have my star wars thing. okay well yes. let me just let me just quickly say this because i don't know uh connor if you know this but they've they're like retconning jizz um <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things where uh, this was brought up. We did a show at the Bell House in Brooklyn, and somebody, or, or no, this, it got brought up at Comic Con when we were, and I just adamantly said that it will always be jizz music. Um, there, there's a second term for it that they also use. They're trying to emphasize that one. I think they do want to get away from that joke. Yeah, they're calling it Jats now. Uh, J A. So I don't even understand what you two are talking oh, about right now. This is it's completely so lost on jizz me. Jizz is like the Star Wars equivalent of like you know like the the Star Wars Cantina band like the. Da, 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 I mean, da, da, doing da, da, the music da, da, is is not honestly helping. that's no. not. I mean, that would be it's like if I said, "Hey, have you ever heard of blank band?" And you're like, I, "No, I've never and heard of you them." And the I just start humming a sure. song. That's I mean, it is a very yeah absurd behavior. Yeah. Um. I do know. I do know there is a cantina band. They play yes. in the bar on Tatooine. Okay, there is you that go. right? That is right. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah. But that's that's jizz music. Um, I see. So it's so it's like uh, that. That's what that's what George Lucas like the kind of the term he invented. But then I don't know if he invented it. It was in a novelization of Return of the Jedi. I think I see. But they um, weren't. But we weren't calling cum jizz at that time. I gu- I guess that must have been the case. Yeah, okay. back in the eighties. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think there was. It was one of those things at the time that, like, um, at the time, I think it was like an offhand thing. Like, oh, it's it's a jazz band, but obviously they don't call it jazz. So it was just it could have been. He could have called it jazz or jazz or anything, but he called it jizz. Right. And um, 
And I, I don't think it was ever intended to be like a secret dirty joke or anything. And But they also use jats or whatever the other term is. And I think I totally understand why uh, Disney would be trying to do that because I would not be expecting that they would lean in to be like, guess what? Max Rebo is back and he's playing more jizz. Like, that's not something that <laughs> was this going to happen. This is some jizz in your face yeah. by Max Rebo. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's neither infuriating to me nor is it there's a little bit of like uh, – Streisand affecting of yeah. it, more people are talking about jizz music than ever before now. Yeah. Which yeah. means to me that jizz will never die. No, I, I don't jizz think will it will. Ne- no, there's the, yeah. the fans won't let it die. Um, just yeah, before though, we, there sorry, should be a star Wars, La La Land type movie where, where uh, <laughs> Ryan Gosling saves jizz, <laughs> saves jizz. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, so the only thing I, this is my only contribution to the star Wars discourse. This is recently Brian and I, I have a podcast Connor called the POD cast, uh, where we review, uh, old new metal albums. And so we were reviewing limp biscuits, debut album, $3 bill y'all. And I found this uh, rolling stone profile on them. And part of the rolling stone profile is that all the members of limp biscuit go to Skywalker ranch for a preview of phantom menace before it came out in theaters. <laughs> oh my God. Which is, uh, which is really, I mean, quite special. And, uh, maybe, you know, that could be something that you could talk about in your George Lucas talk show, but yeah, they, they, Fred Durst comes in a separate limo, uh, with Carmen Electra. Uh, <laughs> and so they're talking about that. And then they're also talking about, uh, oh, and he's sorry, he's with Carmen Electra and he's with Justin, who is the old guy from 98 degrees. Uh, and then, uh, he's also with his, his music label boss. And then it says, uh, the assembled junior celebrities mill around on the lawn of Skywalker's fitness facility, clutching their Phantom Menace goodie bags and dutifully supplying MTV with sound bites. Durst mingles with Katie Holmes, all three Hansons, Alyssa Milano, and the guy from Third Eye Blind. Representing <laughs> the dark side of the showbiz force are Ozzy Osbourne, Rob Zombie, and Andy Dick. Oh my god. <laughs> which, oh. Was, which was really beautiful. Then... Uh, Wes Borland, the guitarist of of Limp Bizkit, is a big Star Wars head, and he's mad that Phantom Menace was bad. So he's taking it out on the label head, because I guess the label head was on his phone while the movie was playing and whatever. So Wes is like lighting into him and doesn't let him ride in the uh, in the Limp Bizkit limo that's leaving Skywalker Ranch. So his last name is Sure, like Mike Sure, And uh, <laughs> this is just of unbelievable end to an article an hour after limp biscuit exit the skywalker ranch there is still no sign of sure's taxi he asks tori spelling for a ride in her half empty stretch and the beverly hills 90210 90210 starlet declines it's oh, no. <laughs> it's a tragic comic scene that would be perfect for limp biscuits allegedly wild and honest home video to be released this fall the document is titled poop <laughs> and that's I, the end of the oh. stone profile. <laughs> been to Skywalker Ranch. Oh, sick! Um, yeah, uh, last year, uh, myself and Griffin Newman and Patrick Cotner, who's our show's producer, uh, we were invited to come visit by a fan of the show, and we were sort of given l- like limited access. We were allowed onto the property but not into any of the main buildings. The only building we were allowed into was the, uh, like the cantina where they um, have lunch, where everybody goes to have lunch. And um, the, so I'm picturing that specifically, I'm picturing where uh, that uh, label person could have been waiting. Yeah. (laughs) It's not like I was there during the daytime not like a comfortable place to be stranded there. Like if you're waiting by the gate, just picture any sort of like place you've been with that's like, it's just like woods and a long winding road to get there. It's like not a, uh, would not be a convenient or comfortable place to be left. (laughs) And even if you were back up in the facility, there's really no, there's not like a lobby area. There's not like a place to sit. Yeah. And he's just outside. Wait, and that's probably why the taxi hasn't come, right? Maybe they don't even know where it is. Yeah. It's also like, yeah, it's not particularly easy to get to. 
Um, that is a very bad place to be waiting for a ride to take you home. And for Tori Spelling to tell you, no, you can't and come in my limo. That is, a, that is a, it's not like you're waiting at a hotel to be taken to the airport or waiting at the airport to be taken. To, like it is a place that you're not allowed into the buildings and there's not a comfortable, it's not a public facing place. So like even the building where we had lunch, that would be closed presumably after a screening. So you're just there in the dark, um, just on a patch of road waiting. <laughs> <laughs> just in uh, case you're wondering, uh, poop never came out, uh, by uh-huh. the way. Yeah. Limp Bizkit got constipated and, uh, yeah, yeah. it never, it never yeah. was released, but they, we, we did a bunch of articles for that album and all of them cited the fact that this poop DVD was coming out and then it never, <laughs> and then it never did. Oh man. So sad, sad yeah. times. Anyway, speaking of sad things, let's move on to our social media updates. What Connor, we always like segment. Oh right, we do the fucking theme song. Now let's move on. <laughs> God damn it. It's time to discuss what popped up in your feed. Who are you following? What did you see? Sports or politics, tweets and skis, hot takes and the TL of fast food freaks. It's also social media. Update. Connor, we always like to start with the guests. What's going on on your social media? Um, I basically have two modes in social media these days. It feels like for my own sanity, I'm either posting, I'm either promoing, I'm just using it to promo stuff, uh, or I started drawing comics. Okay. Um, and, and so, like, uh, I wanted to be a cartoonist when I was a kid, and then I realized by the time I... Uh, was a teenager that I uh, it was just too hard. I wasn't good enough at it, and it would be frustrating. And I I enjoyed doing comics, so I've just been doing them for fun. Where like I started, I did a week of Peanuts comics, and then I quit. And I'm like, this is great. I did them; they didn't have to be great, and then I stopped doing them. Uh, <laughs> where I just decided for a week to do a bunch of peanut strips that were when we were waiting for the first Trump indictment to happen. I just did a week of peanut strips where the Peanuts gang was like having their various reactions to waiting for the Trump indictments. <laughs> uh, and then I started doing, um, I started doing uh, when the NYPD announced they had this robot cop that now p- strolls the subways. Yeah. I thought, Hey, that, and it looks kind of like um, uh, there's this character called the schmoo that used to be in old comics. Like used to be in a comic strip called little Abner. And then later on, for some reason became part of the Flintstones universe. There was like a, a Flintstones yes. show where, Fred and Barney are cops and they're trying to catch the schmoo. Okay. Um, the schmoo basically looks like a, a made of marshmallow sort of, it's sort of like a bowling pin with whiskers. And that's basically what this, uh, um, K five, this NYPD robot cop looks like. It's got kind of a pear shape. And so I just did like a week of strips about this character. And what feels great about it is I do it. And then I get seven days into these, I'll get tired of them. And I'll be like, this is what would have happened if I tried to be a professional <laughs> cartoonist. So I would have been living in a prison of my own creation for a year. Like I, I do it for a week. I get bored of it. And then I'm like, no, no, that's not the job. You got to do this for years. You got to do this for decades. So I'm either doing comics or I'm like promoting stuff. And that's what I'm sort of like, that, that's all that's going on with me. And then trying not to get into fights, trying not to get into arguments. I don't, I try to avoid, I'll often start to type something and then I'll look at it and I'm like, nope. And then I'll just delete them. Like, that's it's healthy. As good as, yeah. It's as good as, as posting it. That's do you the way get... to do it. I mean, I think, sorry, John, I, no, I'll, no, you're good. I'll just say the, I mean, I'm not really posting on Twitter anymore at all. Like it's off my phone. It's not, it's not great to go on, but the thing you can do or used to be able to do, cause I think they actually got rid of circles. Um, and obviously you can just do it with a locked account, but it was nice using Twitter circles to quote tweet people and like threaten them or whatever, or like say like really mean things that, where it's like, you know, they're not going to see this. I I'm just kind of like getting this off my chest here. Yeah. A, a way of, of getting the venting the feeling without actually starting a confrontation the way you would in real life. You would exactly. see something and you'd mutter it under your breath rather yeah. than going up to the person and be like, I don't like your shirt. Yeah. 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 Are you, Connor, do you get, uh, like, are you just allowed to kind of draw the peanuts people? Did you get in trouble for any of that or they don't care? Um, I didn't make any, it was just on Instagram for like, right. a, yeah, it's right. just like seven Instagram posts. I would argue, I think it's covered by parody. Um, gotcha. cause I'm obviously spoofing them. It's not like I made, I wasn't going to start manufacturing Snoopy dolls. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
the uh, the real peanuts. Um, <laughs> it's one of those things where uh, the smart move is to uh, ignore it because the worst it would do is maybe make someone aware of what peanuts is or something. And like, I, I don't think it would. I don't think people were suddenly like, well, now I won't. I, I won't participate in peanuts reading or buying of merchandise because. I saw a political satire and it might have even been real. I don't know, but yeah. <laughs> peanuts has gone so political that I can't stand it. Do people like the comics? Are they happy to see these from you? I think so. Yeah. It's, it's it got a pretty positive response from, I mean, it's just my friends and whoever's following me. It's not like a, um, it, I, I think I am enough. Also, I was the fun thing about doing the peanuts things was I was specifically trying to do them in the comedic style of peanuts. Um, right. Let me see if I can read one of them. Um, to give you an idea sure. of what they were, the first one, I, I was trying, I was looking at, at uh, remembering like, okay, there's like, um, peanuts do this, peanuts do that. Like one of the ones is like, um, Peppermint Patty and Marcy often will be um, at uh, a theater of some sort watching like the, concerts for tiny tots or something that's like an ongoing um thing or there'd be like you have snoopy on his doghouse there's certain i was trying to touch on certain kinds of yeah archetypal did you do the uh the, the psychiatry booth or whatever i didn't do the psychiatry booth so the first one was um it's uh charlie brown and linus at the wall where they sort of like st stand next to each other philosophizing right. and linus says trump is calling for protests if he's indicted and then he turns to Charlie Brown and says, do you think it will be like January 6th? And then Charlie Brown says, don't ask me. I thought Avatar 2 would flop. <laughs> <laughs> so you sort of bring in uh, other, like, other pop culture things as well. Okay. Well, like, Peanuts did that too. There were, yeah. like, Peanuts would, like, do, like, flash dance parodies and stuff where they make a reference to, like, whatever the big thing was at the time. Like, there, if you read through, I have, like, the... I have all of the peanut strips. Like I have a thing I call Schultz Mountain. Yeah. I actually, for a while, I was thinking about doing a podcast called Schultz Mountain. I call it that because they're in these slipcases, so they stack up. They're about like four and a half feet tall or whatever. It's yeah. Tall. Oh wow! Wow. Fifty years of peanuts books, and when you read through them in order, there are a lot of strips. You're like, oh, this didn't get collected in a lot of like collections because it's so specific to like baseball at that time or right. some actor at that time. The second one I did was Peppermint Patty and Marcy at the theater, and they're looking at their little programs. And Peppermint Patty says, it's called Drag Queen Story Hour, and the folks who won't do a thing to prevent school shootings apparently hate it. And then Marcy says, aren't those the same people who cut arts funding for schools? And then Peppermint Patty says, fascists are weird, Marcy. <laughs> 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 so... It is going full Doonesbury, I realize. It's really like going very topical. Yeah. I love it. Um and uh and then it's just like the um it'll be like Linus and Lucy standing next to each other and Lucy's looking grumpy and she says, That grand jury better indict Trump today. And then Linus says, I heard it might not happen until next week. And then Lucy goes, Next week. And then we see Linus like on the ground like he's been hit and he's got like the disoriented <laughs> marks and he says Nobody appreciates a well-informed citizen. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. That's and true. These are, you know, these are, these are legit. Um, these are legit. Like uh, they have the vibe. I'm proud of capturing the, the rhythm of a Schultz joke. Yeah. There's something that's like a little old fashioned, but it's a little predictable. It's never that surprising, but it's very satisfying. Yes. Um, yeah. That's a good way of putting it for sure. I love yeah. that. That's yeah. great. So I, so it's and it's again like the genius of actual professional cartoonists is that they have the staying power to be able like it, it's I did like a little over a week of peanuts and I was like I'm out I can't, I can't no more in the yeah tank. finding like a unique way in for all of the characters all the time too and just yeah it's tricky yeah it has to be I think I think to do it well to be the thing you want to do more than anything it has to like consume you in a way that uh i'm i'm a a, a dabbler you know yeah but it's i've fun. never yeah. been consumed by anything and at such a degree uh. <laughs> yeah it, it is fun to dabble like yeah. i really like doing it 
but it's purely like, it, and it's also just entirely meant as an homage. Now, I did, I did also do like a week of, of strips about David Zaslav, the, the head of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> where, when that big profile came out, uh, I did a week of strips that was just him making phone calls. And it's very like sort of savage and biting and, uh, I probably shouldn't even mention because there's no upside to uh, <laughs> my wanting to work in show business if I'm going to do like, uh, but generally uh, I just do these comics for fun. They're just a little a creative way of blowing off steam and getting a few jokes out without, uh, without too much work, without too much work and without any stakes at all. There's no, um, there, there's if I if I even if I wanted to ever like publish something and do a comic thing for real, it would require a level of effort that I'm not yet prepared to uh, put into it. Yeah, love it, love yeah. it, Stefan. What's going on in your social media? Uh, well, I just got back from TwitchCon in Las Vegas. Congratulations. Well, I, it, look, it was look it at was, you, big boy. It was well, I've big got boy my TwitchCon. I've got my sweater. You know, I yeah, got I noticed the, you got your little water got, bottle, the big water bottle here. God, you're lame. I know, but Shell. um. It, yeah, it, big time chill. Do they it's, what? What do they do for you there when you're a partner? Like, well, do they, does it? They gave me uh, check check this. Look look at this. Check this out. Some free keyboard caps. Okay. Oh my god. Yeah. I mean, That's last it. Year, last do you year have they, to buy. Did you have to buy your pass to go, or if you're a partner, you get to go oh, for free? Or? You still you still have to. Yeah, you still pay. It's crazy. So you paid to go to that shit. I did. I think if the next time it's in Vegas, I will not be going <laughs> because I. I've been to Vegas a couple times before and I don't, I didn't hate it, but this time it was like, there was TwitchCon happening. There was uh, like a Blink-182, like big, like tour yeah, when happening. When we were young festival. When we were young, that oh, was happening. Oh yeah, that was, that was this weekend too. Yeah, Holy shit. There yeah, was, that was huge. It was like Blink-182 and Green Day and yeah, a bunch of like old punk and emo bands. It was massive. There was a big um, like cowboy, like, um, like rodeo thing going on as well. There were like multiple, like, it, so it was so crazy to get around they're doing construction for uh on the strip for the f1 race because they're going to have the race on the strip which is going to look cool obviously but it's like destroyed the entire city and it's like oh impossible to get anywhere um so it was just i mean it's just, yeah it was it was whatever but um it was it was fun you know it was it was nice it was good to see that didn't sound, it doesn't sound fun to be honest you're you so you're you're in a packed city full yeah. of uh fucking internet losers and yeah. you got some keyboard caps to show for it yeah and sounds bad and the sweatshirt i mean i bought the sweatshirt but okay um, well yeah but um it was it was very fun we met with like our our manager there and oh um, we and met let, with our no for the first time there. in person because we haven't met him in uh, person uh, uh, but it was just there was a very funny moment which was he was like oh yeah i i haven't been able to catch your guys's like evening streams because they're like I'm, I'm busy in the evening and i was like oh that's we, well we've been streaming in the morning you should watch a stream in the morning um and i was like yeah we've been watching uh entire episodes of the price is right and he's like what because he's also like a lawyer too so he was like you you cannot be doing that like don't do that you'll 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 lose your channel or whatever and then the next day, uh, he was doing like a panel talking about like monetization on Twitch with like another lawyer and a couple other streamers. And they specifically referenced the Price is Right thing and then just like stared at us in the audience and like held back laughter. So that was it was a nice moment. Um, that sounds like a bad moment, actually. It was funny. You had to be there. They're, they were they were <laughs> laughing about it. It was it was a good time. But um, yeah, overall, I mean, I, I yeah, John, you've been to Vegas. Connor, I assume you've been to, to Vegas. It's just just the airport. Oh wow! Okay. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. I, I went once for a wedding that, for some reason, they were holding in July, and it was plus forty eight. Uh, or sorry, I guess that would was, be like one hundred and twenty. Yeah, uh, it was un. It was. It was. Um, I didn't like it. I had a bad yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's also not the city I, for me. I don't drink. I don't really gamble. I'm not. I'd go down to see like a Golden Knights game, or I'd sure. go down to see like a UFC or something. Yeah. But yeah, I'm not. I, I'm not clamoring to get back there. No. Yeah. No. I, I, I got a sense of Vegas from the airport because it doesn't feel like other airports. Um, because there's all the slot machines everywhere. I, I won I, 115 bucks as I was leaving yesterday morning at the slot machine at the wheel of fortune hey. slot machine, which was, which was great. But then it's like, you should go, you should go back there. I know it, it, it did make <laughs> me want to like keep going, which I guess is sort of how gambling works, but yep, yeah, that's kind of their whole thing. I, I the closest I've been, I've been to Lake Tahoe, um, 
I was touring with the band Guster. I was uh, doing comedy opening for them. And one of the venues was at, it was at the casino where Frank Sinatra Jr. was uh, kidnapped. Oh, wow. Um, and he was also like known a, as Stinky, right? <laughs> yes, Stinky, Stinky, yeah. <laughs> Stinky Sinatra. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, yeah, the exact plot of Star Wars Clone Wars yeah. is uh, inspired by this. Um, no, I... And Frank Sinatra Jr. was an opening act um, and was kidnapped backstage by people who wanted to get money from the Sinatra, from Frank Sinatra. And I, it was such a, I remember I spent the whole day sort of wandering around. I'd never been in a casino environment like that. And I found it so depressing. It was just not my scene at all. It sucks. And, uh, and, then, and then I was just like, man, the last... This is a place where opening acts get kidnapped, um, which was I, I then brought up. I thought it was very funny, and I brought it up, and the crowd was not amused at all by me talking about the fact this is <laughs> this is the same place where Frank Sinatra Jr. got kidnapped. And uh, I think one of the things that's interesting, if I remember correctly, is that the um, Sinatra actually like offered more money than they were asking for. He's like, they were like, we want this much money, and he was like. I'll give you this much money. And they were like, no, 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 you don't need to like, you don't need to, <laughs> it was like terrifying to them that, uh, I'm going to find this detail. It was like terror. It was like a, a realization that they were in over their heads, right? That they were like, Oh God, this guy's like bigger than even we thought this guy's the chairman of the board. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he thinks uh, it's, it's kind of like the Austin powers joke. It's like, he thinks our ransom is bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think there was a thing where he was like, um, and I think they ended up catching all of them immediately. It was, yeah, they, they like, they were trying to, yeah, it was like, it's a, they asked for his room number at the desk, pretending to be delivery man, delivery men. Then they found the room number and they had pistols and they found the singer, Frank Sinatra Jr., sinking his ivory white teeth into a plate of fried chicken. This is written very like. <laughs> Ivory white teeth. <laughs> okay. It's ivory white teeth into a plate of fried chicken. Um, yeah. And then they wrapped a band of masking tape around his mouth to stop him from calling out for help. Uh, they threw him into the trunk of their car. It's like a full on kidnapping. And uh, yeah, it's crazy. They demanded $240,000 for him. I'm trying to find the amount that. Oh, God. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Anyway, check your local library for that story. <laughs> well, the thing I think actually that bothers me about Vegas, Connor, is like, yeah, I find casinos depressing to be in. Like, generally speaking, a lot of comedy clubs are in casinos, so you end up in casinos. And and uh, I find them to be quite depressing just in general, like just the people who are there. And, and you can feel like the amount of money that the casinos are making off of these people. And it's very greasy and bad feeling. And Vegas actually doesn't feel like that. And that somehow makes it feel worse. You're like, everybody here seems happy to be do, to be losing all their money constantly. And they're like, because they're just like, I'm in Vegas. This is part of the thing. You just yeah. lose $500 in the casinos when you're here. And you're like, oh, this actually feels worse somehow. Like, that seeing, they've like tricked people into not being depressed in the casino. Yeah, but then there are also just like, it's so much of it is just there, there'll be like a bunch of like 90 year olds just yes. like sitting at like the Lord of the Rings slot machines and, and just like staring straight ahead, like not moving. And yeah. And, and just like the cigarette smell everywhere. Cause you can smoke yeah, inside. It's it was just like, ah, oh, it's yeah, it's, it wasn't great. John, what's going on? Uh, very quick. For you? Got a very quick one today. Yeah. Uh, one of our favorite, uh, you know, I think safe to say one of our favorite posters is iced tea. And uh, I think, you know, one thing we love about Ice-T here on Block Party is his sort of, it's the way he tweets obviously is great, but he'll he'll get into sort of a stream of consciousness mode yes. where he kind of ties a few ideas together all in one tweet. And he had a beautiful one from this morning. This is actually just from an hour ago. So this is some, this is some fresh iced tea. This is, this, I just brewed this. <laughs> this iced tea, baby. Uh, but yeah, this is great. So this is uh, ice. And he loves also... He has a lot of rules. He always talks about how he's he lives by certain rules. So this is another classic version of that tweet. He says, I live by a simple rule. I'm as nice as you'll let me be. Respect me 
all respect you. Quote, you get what you give via new radicals. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so he's quoting the new radicals at yeah. the end of his tweet. I love that. You get oh, what you give via new radicals. Only Ice-T is doing that. He's, he's so funny, man. He's God. so good. And I just like, I love the idea of Ice-T jamming out to you get what you give by new radicals. That Absolutely. just put like a nice image in my mind. Yeah. Oh, he's great. I mean, the, the, the image I always get of Ice-T is the post he did where he's like, this is a picture of me playing uh, like Fallout New Vegas while my wife is giving birth in the hospital. And he's like brought a TV and like an Xbox or whatever to the to the hospital. And it's because he's a gamer. He's a big gamer, too. So, yeah. Yeah. And a great poster as well. Yeah. Love ice. Shout out to Ice-T. That's yeah. really all I have. I have no other comment other than you Not get much more you needs to be said. Yeah. Via new radicals. Uh, speaking of giving and getting, let's move on to our block tale. Did you tweet? You brought receipts, Blocktail. Woo! No longer can see the post. It's a Blocktail. Woo! You probably deserved it. It's a Blocktail. Connor, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, I really struggled with this because I was thinking, like, oh, the people I block or for the most part, people that I don't want to like draw attention to it. I yeah. don't want to, it's people that you don't want to give any extra oxygen to. And then I was like, well, who's blocked me? And I'm like, I have no idea. I don't know who's blocked me. I assume I used to do these long mega threads on Twitter that, um, I would like tweet it out. Um, all of the first like a hundred Porky Pig. I bought this DVD of uh, called Porky Pig 101. That was the first hundred Porky Pig cartoons. And I decided I'm never going to watch this unless I like make it a project. So I started like tweeting about each one. And then I started doing this with other cartoons. I started doing this with old uh, Disney and Looney Tunes kind of cartoons. Yeah. And I assume there were people who blocked me during that. They were just like, this is not what I want. I don't want to see a, a, a tweet of every, I watched like all the Roadrunner cartoons in order. Um, and it was like commenting on how like, you never watch these in order. They're normally like scrambled up. And um, so I, so I'm like, I don't know who has blocked me. And I remembered that, um, and this requires a little bit of context because it's not my main Twitter account. It's actually a Twitter account I don't really use anymore. Okay. Um, when the Chris Gethard show, which is a show that was on a couple different cable channels, and before that it was a public access show, and before that it was like a, a midnight comedy show in New York City, starring obviously comedian uh, Chris Gethard. Uh, in its early like public access days in New York City, I ran for president on the show. And uh, I had done an episode. I was doing like short films with a, an animator. We were doing these little, like animated shorts in the episodes. And then there was a week where I was like, someone didn't show up for the panel, and they said, "Connor, get on the panel." And I, I felt so uncomfortable. I thought I did a terrible job. I had no charisma. And I'm like, I just don't belong on the panel. I need to come up with like a character bit to do on the show. And then I thought, oh, what if I was the Gethard Show candidate for president? This is like for the. <laughs> This is in 2011. Okay. And my whole my whole campaign was based on the idea that I I was 35 years old, so I was old enough to be president. And that was the entire <laughs> campaign. Like you had just gotten old enough. Yes, that the constitution says that's one of the three rules. You got to be born in America, you got to be 35 years old. There's like not a lot, but that's one of them. And uh it was a campaign that was uh I threw myself into it comedically, which was the idea being that we've never even come close to having a 35 year old president, but like the, the, they put this number in the constitution and we will elect presidents who were 50, 60, 70 years old, but never the perfect number 35. <laughs> and so I started this in summer of 2011 and then a month into my campaign, I turned 36 and I had to, and I spent a month like just doing all these bits on the show about 35, <laughs> the perfect number and then i had to like i'd broken my only campaign promise. and and then i was like but if you round to the nearest five i'm still 35 and knowing that before the election would happen it was so far out that i was going to turn 37 like two months before the so i was just like 
so these like betrayals were built into the campaign where yeah. the people were like, and so we did like, I, I challenged everyone to a debate and we actually did a live debate because, um, uh, I ended up, there's a, the, uh, Jimmy McMillan, who is the candidate who's known for the rent is too damn high. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a character in the New York scene. He agreed to deb- debate me live on air. So there's an hour long debate between <laughs> me and Jimmy McMillan. <laughs> Uh, in October of 2011, um, where we where Gethard moderated the thing, and so I did this bit, and then we get to 2012, and obviously I did not win the election. I had this breakdown live on air, and <laughs> uh, and then within the, we did an election special where I have a complete like breakdown when I realize I can't win, I'm not going to win. I'm sort of begging, please, please, like I I really want to do this. Yeah, I really want to be president, and then. I leave and I come back a few minutes later having shaved my beard off and I'm dressed in like a skin tight uh, sort of gymnastic suit. And I announced I'm going to win at least one gold medal in the 2016 (laughs) Summer Olympics. So for four years, I was doing this bit that was like uh, about me training for the Olympics. I'm completely non-athletic and I'm trying to find, is there a category? Is there a way? And, uh, at a point where you know the other show did a pilot for comedy central that didn't get picked up and i was sort of thinking like oh man if this gets to a network that has a budget i could continue doing the bit maybe we'd actually get some resources behind it send me to rio for the olympics but then that didn't happen and so i was like trying to figure out what do i do when it gets close to the olympics i can't afford to go to rio so at the last moment in the summer of 2016 I did a, uh, like the night before the Olympics were about to start, I did the show at UCB where I uh, tore off my gymnastics outfit, revealed my presidential suit, and announced I was running for president again. (laughs) Um, I specifically said, because this was obviously, in 2012, I wasn't really uh, campaigning against Obama. It was more about, like, me. I want to be president. In 2016, obviously, the stakes were a lot higher. And I specifically said, I am not running because I want to win. I just want attention. So I was saying, vote for Hillary, but pay attention to me. And this was, it's hard to think now back to a time when you could have fun with the idea of a novelty candidate running for president, because obviously that was completely ruined by a novelty candidate winning. Uh, <laughs> you can't, it's, it's almost like inconceivable. Now the idea that like the comedy bit would be like, you notice like people aren't doing that anymore. It used to be the, like Donald duck and Snoopy and all these people, yeah. they'd run for president or something, you know, and people don't do that anymore. Cause like, no, no, you might win. And then <laughs> it would be bad. Um, and so like I did this campaign in 2016, that was more about just like paying attention to the bit, but it was actually actively, campaigning for hillary clinton to win while saying like pay attention to me and so i had this twitter handle this is a long wind up to me getting blocked so my twitter handle was 35 2012 emphasizing my age and the um i switched it to uh was it like 16 ratliff something yeah it was like 16 ratliff gold or something and i tweeted it back or something and then I was trying to follow people and I was blocked by game change author, John Heilman. <laughs> uh, and I don't know why I hadn't tweeted at him. Yeah. Um, I just went to follow him from that account. And it says, you've been blocked. He blocked my, and he was a, you know, his beat was, you know, presidential campaigns. He hosts that show, uh, the circus on Showtime. Yeah. It's all about like the goings on within this. And I couldn't believe it. Cause like, what did I do? It was not an aggressive Twitter handle. It, I wasn't shit posting or anything from it. I was just posting about my presidential campaign. And I, I believe that that account, which is mostly dormant, uh, is still blocked by John Heil and by at J Heil. And I tweeted, I'm looking now at a couple of things where I'm like, I don't know why he blocked me. I'm baffled that he even, how he even knew it existed. It wasn't like I was getting massively retweeted. The bit had lost all of its oxygen. It was, yeah. it, it, it was, it was fully within a corner of a corner of a niche of New York city improv comedy at that point. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I had never tweeted on him. I'd never tagged him anything. 
and I, when I went to follow follow him, I was already blocked. Wow. Do you think it was and, like he thought you were mocking the presidency or something? No, because that's the other thing. It's not like he's, you know, uh, it's not like he's a a political pundit who uh, has no sense of humor. His whole approach is kind of like making jokes and being lighthearted and right. looking for the looking at the absurd. And, you know, it's not he's not someone who uh, typically like doesn't get the joke. So I don't think it was anything where he was like, how dare they? This is a serious time or a, right. an important institution that's being undermined. It was more I was more baffled that he had ever he must have encountered a weird re- retweet or something and then blocked it. Yeah, or, or maybe like list, or possibly like maybe you had some fans who were like tweeting at him to be like, "Hey, you should write about you should write about Connor," you know, and like maybe. I mean, if they did that, they didn't tag me in those requests. Right, right, yeah. So, so this was to, like, like a, yeah, it's weird. this was like in in like Star Trek terms that they discovered a new planet and they got there and the planet was like no Federation one. Like, how did they even know? About <laughs> yeah, this? This, was, this was first contact as far yeah. as I was concerned. Uh, uh, that is so weird. I do I do like a good like mysterious block like this where you just don't you have no clue why. And it's been it's been what? It's been I mean that seven was 2016. years. Yeah. yeah, that was like September or so of August of, of 2016. Has he blocked because your was, main account? No, and he does not follow. So <laughs> that's also so weird because you would think if it was like something he was mad at that you were doing that it would be like an across the board kind of like, Oh, I don't like what I don't like this Connor Ratliff guy. Yeah. It had to be something so small and so instant and so easy. It had to be something where it's like, what's this? No, it had to be the amount of time block had to, it was not like a block where he was like looking or digging around to see right. like, what's this, what's this. This was the thing where he saw something he didn't want it in his feed. And he was like block. Absolutely. Like, but I don't know. Wow. And there was a part of me when Dead Eyes was sort of like taking off, every now and then there'd be, you know, someone like Jake Tapper or someone who I'd find out was like a fan had been listening. And there was a part of me that thought, uh, when I was looking at this, because I haven't thought of this interaction since 2016, except every now and then when I'll see him on TV and I'll kind of remember, like, oh yeah, he blocked my presidential Twitter. <laughs> and um when I went back to check it this time, I thought, oh, I wonder if there's any chance that in the meantime, he's become uh, a fan of Dead Eyes or something and wouldn't have made the connection. Because why would he? He has no memory of this. Like, yeah. I guarantee you, like, whatever it was that, because I didn't even do that much. It was really, truly the dying days of a, of a bit that had lasted for five years that I was fully looking to, like, like, this. this was a bit that I was looking for, like, a landing. I was looking for, like, Here's what I'll do. I'll run for attention within this small little comedy circle. I'll do a couple of funny things and then we're out. And instead, it was sort of like it wasn't just the death of the bit. It felt like this whole sphere of comedy was gone. People used to uh, there was a I, there was a, a guy named Pat Paulson on the old Smothers Brothers comedy show before I was born, who like was the presidential candidate for that show. There's like a rich yeah. tradition of like comedy bit or or a lot of times it'll be like corporate like the pillsbury doughboys running for a president or something it's just like a bit i haven't seen one since then because it's it's sort of like a completely burned area for now like you just can't do it because the again it's because you can't trust the american voting public (laughs) not to vote for your joke yeah the rock and the rock in 2024 or whatever we're doing yeah i mean you can still do like a dog as like the mayor of a small town at least like that hasn't gone away so yeah and that'll never uh, go uh, away yeah well because the people and those have the highest approval rating like the um, yeah mayor sally the dog mayor of new york city couldn't be more popular as a beloved figure within new york city politics uh and is I think doing a great job as me <laughs> when this episode comes out, I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to tweet it at John and see if we can get to the bottom of this. Cause this is a crazy, we're going to fix this for you. We're going to, well, yeah, we may not fix it, but we'll find out yeah. if he even and, remembers and have to start but, posting on the old account again too, of course. But yeah. Um, yeah, I don't need him to follow that account. I, I actually, my, the ideal world is he'll follow me on Instagram because 
even my my Twitter account. I won't call it by uh, its its uh, new name. No, yeah, we um, don't either on this program. The but I feel like until someone else buys Twitter uh, in a fire sale, um, I don't I don't care who follows me or doesn't follow me there. It's it's I'm there because there's so much for the same reason I haven't quit Facebook because I just have so much like. All every now and then, even like looking up the stuff for this, I was like, there's a, a uh, you have like uh, history on it that you don't want to lose. And I tried doing that thing where I download all my data and I, my computer can't open it. It's like, it's too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I need to find like a supercomputer that can uh, crack the, the code of the zip file, you know? <laughs> Producer Dan can help you with that for sure. Um, okay, we many have a, ter- many terabytes, <laughs> many, many terabytes. We have a pretty crazy listener block this week. Okay. Uh, Ooh. so this, this person wants to remain anonymous, uh, but they say, uh, Hey, and the, the name, the names have been changed. Uh, Hey, blocked boys. I went to high school in a small town and didn't have a lot of luck with dating, but around 11th grade, I was quote unquote, talking to a girl from a nearby town who was a senior. Basically, a lot of texting and on again, off again, hanging out. While we were hanging out one time, she mentioned that this substitute teacher at her school confiscated her phone for texting in class and then proceeded to text her, presumably getting her number from the phone. I was vaguely aware of who the guy was because he had recently graduated from the college in my town. And my reaction was, hey, maybe you should tell someone with authority about that. That sounds really weird. She agreed it was weird, but she didn't want to do anything about it yet. The relationship kind of fizzled, but we hung out again a few months later, and she tells me the same sub had recently left flowers in her locker on Valentine's Day. Ah. I again said that this was really creepy and she should tell someone about it, but she was iffy on it again. And as we talked, I got the impression that she might not actually be that upset by it. We didn't really see each other much after that, but later that year, I was playing Call of Duty with a guy that knew her too, and he said her and the sub were dating. I was 18 and this was the most OC thing that had ever happened to me. So I told just about everyone I knew about it, showing them her Facebook page with pictures of them. And then one day, maybe because word got around, I was talking about her or maybe because the sub thought I was a romantic threat. When I tried to look at her profile, she had unfriended me. Not too long after I was refriended without any comment. And I did receive an invitation to their wedding, but I didn't go because I wasn't in town that day. Because of how small this world is, I heard from someone at her bridal shower that they told their story exactly how it happened, like it was a funny meet cute. From the last time I looked, they're still together, have two kids, and seem to be happy. She's a nurse in the area I grew up in and was on call when my brother and sister-in-law had their kid, so it's her signature and my sub's last name on my nephew's birth certificate. Oh. Thanks for the pods. Huh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> kind of uh, kind of wild. I, I mean, <laughs> obviously wild, but just the idea that they tell the story like, yeah, we met yeah, when I was in high school and everybody's nuts. just like, yeah, cool. Cool. Yeah. Huh, okay. Yeah. There's that, there's that weird logic that it's like, but like, like stick the landing, then it's okay. Yeah. We're married now. We have two kids. We're yeah. still together. We, we were meant to be together. It just sucks we that we met. We proved everybody wrong. Yeah. It it, but in another more it, real way. <laughs> they said it would never work because it was a crime. <laughs> uh, yeah. Truly, truly one of the more wild uh, block tales we've ever had. If you want to send one in, you can do so at blocked at blockparty.com or you can fill out the form on our website. You can also donate to the show at patreon.com slash block party. $5 a month gets you access to three bonus episodes every single month. Last week, we had Dana Smith on for another very unhinged mailbag episode. And tomorrow, it is the biggest, I would say, Stefan, the biggest block party bonus event in the show's history. That's right. Yeah. Uh, so you do not want to miss it. Dropping on Halloween, it's going to be very, very special. You're not going to want to miss it. So head on over to the Patreon. We also have ad-free episodes merch discounts, all that stuff. So check it out. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram at block party pod on uh, blue sky and YouTube at block party. And if you like the show, tell a friend. Okay, Connor, we are here at the end of the show and that means it's time for the top three, three, two, one. Three, two, one. Uno, 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 uno. Mustard. Three. Sauce. Two. Girlfriend. Uno, 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 uno. Connor, your topic, please. Uh, 
top three uh, kinds of weather. Ooh. Oh. I actually don't uh, think we've done that. No, we haven't. I I I I made sure I scoured through you have a Google <laughs> Doc? Yes. A very a deeply frustrating Google Doc at this point because you think of things then you start scanning <laughs> for them and you realize like oh, okay okay uh, and I was delighted because I didn't think of that I didn't think of that many but I thought enough things that I checked that they'd been done that uh, I was starting to think oh no this is going to take so much longer and then when the word weather didn't come up I thought I think we got a winner here we got a winner so are you saying My, like uh, like a mood or like an actual like forecast where are we at with the favorite types of weather um experience like your favorite type of weather as if like you wake up in the morning and this is the weather that's happening and got you it. think top 3 my got dad it. uh the he was a weatherman oh, and nice. uh, a local weatherman so i feel like this is a, i'll dedicate this top 3 uh, to him, he's uh, he lives in Florida now, where the weather is. I hate the weather. That's a yeah. little spoiler. <laughs> uh, the um, and he lived in the era of weatherman where um, he wasn't like a trained meteorologist. He was just he was just had a good broadcast ability. He'd look up what do they say the weather is, and he'd go out and be like, "Here's the weather." <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay, Connor, yeah. what's your number three? Number three, I'm going to say. Um, Daytime thunderstorm, pitch black sky Ooh. with lightning. Oh, I feel yes. like we don't get that up here. Well, John, maybe in Ontario you get that, but BC. I'm in Calgary, Stefan. No, so no, that but, is but in Alberta. I mean, but I mean, you grew up in Ontario, so yes. you would have seen that. No, in Ontario. it is definitely more common in Ontario for sure. Yeah. Yes, I have yeah. seen that, and it's the thing I like the most about that, and I can weigh in because this is not in my top three. Um, is you can smell it. That's kind of like the cool, like when a thunderstorm is about to come, like a big thunderstorm, you can actually smell it in the air, which is weird but cool okay so yeah that's a good that's a good choice yeah. uh All Stephen, right. you're number three my number three uh is like a winter's day where it's like very overcast and it's just like like the sky is just gray like you can't really see the clouds but it, the entire sky is a cloud almost and it's not like too cold but it's a little windy and like you know the leaves are that are on the ground are sort of blowing around a little bit and it's just very like crisp um and yeah there's something there's something very nice about that going for a walk in that weather is is quite nice a gray day. Yeah. My number three, I'm going to go with uh, the good old fashioned snow day. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, as an adult, maybe less exciting, but certainly as a kid, when you thought like a bunch of snow was going to hit, then you wake up in the morning and a bunch of snow did hit and maybe you're going to have the day off. And if you have the day off, you're going to get to go tobogganing or skating or whatever. Uh love that i love a beautiful just a beautiful and i'll say like what a skier would call a bluebird day so like where it's it has snowed the night before horribly but now it is sunny and nice out really great and also a fun little movie if you've never seen snow day it's uh it's a very fun little movie chris elliott is super funny in it and actually it might be daniel stern instead of chris elliott i always get those two confused anyway great movie if you've never seen it snow day my number three connor your number two Number two, I'll say full on, full on snow day. Can't, can't go anywhere. No choice. You gotta stay in. Uh, it's been a while since we've had that in New York City last year. We basically had no snow all winter. I'm skeptical as to whether we'll get any uh, over the next uh, six months or whatever. But I, I like that. I like the day where you have no choice. Whatever you had planned, you can't do it unless it's remote. Um, maybe that there's less novelty to that in a. Uh, where the in an in an age where we had full lockdown for uh, such a <laughs> intense period of time, and the uh, but in a way it's like a little callback to that because the snow day is like it's going to be over quick. We've shifted our uh, our our frame of how long we can. So yes. it's a little bit like oh maybe we'll the FaceTime with some people or maybe we'll oh go gonna have to do some of the things like now it's almost like catch up like. Maybe I'll start reading one of those books I thought I was going to read during lockdown. I didn't read. Yeah. You know? Yes. A little mini lockdown, if you will. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Love that. Stefan, you're number two. I'm going to say like October ish, like early autumn um, and like a very crisp, cool, like sunny day in autumn where like the leaves are so changing So it's basically color. the same as your number three, but the no. sun is out. No, because this is autumn. That, that was winter. Um, but I mean, you do get some of that in autumn as well. Very similar. Yeah, it is. It is kind of similar, but I, I do like a sunny day where it's like kind of cool outside. Um, and you get that in Vancouver occasionally, but I mean, unfortunately living here, it is, it does rain 
an absolutely insane amount. Um, so it does make you appreciate those days even more. Like John, I feel like you're going to have that like all the time in Calgary, right? Cause it's sunny, nonstop, it's sunny, nonstop here. Yeah. Sunny city yeah. in Canada. Uh, pretty much since I've moved here, there's been some sun every day. Although today is the first snowfall, uh, but it's not as bad as they were. They were saying it could be up to like 10 centimeters and we definitely haven't seen that. Uh, it's more of a dusting today, but this, yeah. this looks like it might be the first day without sun since I've moved here. Yeah. Uh, my number two, I'm going to go with uh, with a little a foggy day. Uh, you kind of wake up, okay. the fog is sort of rolled in. Again, not too cold, not raining, but just like there's a little bit of an air of mystery. Ooh, what's going to happen? Am I going to get murdered? Am I going to have sex? What's going to happen? Yeah, you know. And I feel like foggy also lends itself to music. I like. Nice to put on like the yep. national or elbow or radio head or something when it's like a little foggy out and not very foggy. One time I drove home from Seattle after a modest mouse concert to Vancouver and it was so foggy. You could not see like three feet in front of the car and it was deathly terrifying. <laughs> so I'm saying like a light, a light fog. If you yeah, will. that's a good choice. Thank you. Connor, you're number one. My well, number one is going to be, and this is true of day or night is right before a huge snow when the sky is weirdly it's it's not bright where you have to squint like a sunny day but it's fully lit up sort of clouds that are just packed with snow it's not snowy yet so you're completely unencumbered there's not even that cold sort of walking around knowing it's about to snow i love this also at night because sometimes it's the brightest sort of nights of the year where you look outside and it's just like bright white like snow clouds yeah but you're you have none of the inconvenience of the snowfall that's about to happen you're and it's also not even i've experienced it where you're not even like you can wear a light jacket you can walk uh, if you're just running to the store you don't even need to like bundle up for it you kind of can't believe it's about to happen and you have all the anticipation but none of the things that would inconvenience you but also i have a high tolerance for cold so it keeps a lot of people like off of the streets so it's sort of like depopulates in a nice way places that are normally crowded things that are normally because everyone's already sort of like oh no no it's about to be a storm we gotta go home we gotta we gotta like get out of here so it's actually pretty convenient to get around and do things and it's a nice weather to walk around in that's a really good pick i didn't i didn't even consider that that is a really nice pick um stefan you're number one Again, this is something that doesn't happen too often in Vancouver, but when it does is like waking up and it snowed overnight and you maybe, maybe you didn't know it was going to snow overnight, which is a really nice surprise too, but just like how quiet it is. Um, the, the quiet morning, uh, like a, the, you know, the morning after it snowed all night uh, and you wake up and it's just perfectly silent. Like that is, that is so nice. That is just a nice thing to experience. Uh, and I mean, unfortunately up here in Vancouver, you experience it like maybe once a year. Um, but it is quite nice when it happens. So yeah, and look at us, day. look at us, three internet boys, eight weather phenomenons in none of them include the summer or the sunshine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I hate the sun. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Same here. It, it, it rash. All it does is burn me. Yep. Uh, when there's a sunny day and there's clouds blocking the sun, that's the only kind of sunny day I can tolerate. I just direct sunlight. I might as well be a vampire. It's really, uh, I, I couldn't dislike it more. Yeah, Yeah, no, I I don't like the summer because I overheat very easily. Maybe I'm the same as you, Connor. I I tolerate the cold much better than others. But my my number one is going to involve the sun. But I'm saying a spring day uh, where it's the weather is just starting to turn. So you've had this like long winter. And even if you don't love the sun, there is something a little nice about, oh, I could go outside without a jacket on. Maybe it's sort of the first kind of like, plus 10 plus 12 days. So in America, like 55, 60 day where you're like, I could just be outside in a hoodie. I'm comfortable. The sun is out, but it's not too hot. And it just, it's that even though I don't like the summer, there is still that bit of that anticipation of like, okay, the, the snow is over. We're going to have a nice few months here, even though I don't actually want to be outside that much summertime, (laughs) but it is just a nice feeling, a nice spring Spring day as the weather begins to turn, I think is very, very nice. Good so, pick. Great top great, three. Great top three. I feel like I'm in a good mood now thinking yeah. about all the weather that I like for some reason. Uh, Connor, thank you so much for doing the show. Absolute pleasure to have you. Before we go, anything you'd like to plug? Uh, yeah, there's um, 
the, as you mentioned before, there's the podcast in the cards, uh, which is a narrative podcast. It's a sort of a supernatural romantic comedy. I play the lead in it. And it's, uh, it follows a guy who realizes that he is essentially cursed by fate or the gods to always be a loser. And he tries to battle them, uh, to try to turn his life around. Uh, so I'll plug that also plug because I have it right here and I'm excited about it as well is, uh, and I don't know. If, do you have Record Store Day in Canada? Yeah, we have Record Store Day. Yep. I don't know if this will be on the list for places in Canada, but um, most yeah, of our Amy listeners Mann, are American, so you're you're good. Yeah. Great. Uh, on Record Store Day, Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, which is like the 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 fourth, or th- I think it's the fourth Friday in November. Um, do I have that right? Let me see. Um, you know, Amy Mann uh, did an episode of Dead Eyes and then gave permission to start using her music in at the ends of our episodes. And then at the end of episode 31, she wrote a song, wrote and recorded a song and it is coming out on a oh, final single. Wow. Uh, along with the demo, which has never been released. The song has never been released except in the podcast episode. And so I'm very excited to, even though it's not, it's entirely Amy's uh, music and words. Uh, That's a beautiful cover. The, yeah, it's by um, uh, Tom Mike Hill, who did the Dead Eyes key art, designed the uh, the art for the record. And also, it comes with, and I don't think this has been even announced, it comes with a little, um, like an insert interview with me and Amy talking about the song. Nice. And then the record itself is on white vinyl to look, like an eyeball, to look like an eyeball. So it oh, is sick. literally, the record itself is a dead eye. That is amazing. eyes cannot survive. Uh, outside of the body they die instantly true yeah wow that's beautiful yeah. i'm uh i'm stoked for you and also stoked we got the announcement we got the announcement here that's uh well, this is the first opportunity i've had to ha- have an early <laughs> copy of it here and it's just sitting right there i'm like i gotta mention this record so so in the cards for people who like to listen to scripted funny podcasts and for people who like waiting in lines uh the day after <laughs> thanksgiving or um, if you don't get them in the long line the day after Thanksgiving, there tend to be people who put them up on eBay and sell them for way too much. So hopefully most people will, um, fans of Amy Mann's wonderful music or fans of Dead Eyes, this is the only like product that's come out related to Dead Eyes at all. Um, and I'm just excited because I wanted it to exist. Like my reason for making, I, I, I kept uh, sort of like working to get uh this to come out is just so I could have my copy and now uh, <laughs> fuck the I'm rest the of the world, <laughs> but I'm still going to be like waiting in line at a record store. Cause there's other records I want to get. I really like the idea that one of the records I'll be able to buy will be this song. That is literally a song about me getting fired by Tom Hanks, um, which actually here I'll show you. This is a, this is a fun thing. I'll just be one second. Let me grab it. Yeah. This is just me promoting another, just the timing of this. Please, is, yeah. I just got, I just got, um, Mondo Records just put out for the first time ever the vinyl soundtrack to that. Oh, thing wow. Ever. And it comes with so good a, a seven inch single. It's the full soundtrack, which has never been on vinyl, but it also comes out with a seven inch single of that thing you do. So it's Amazing. a great wow. time. What a Tom song. Hanks related vinyl records. Maybe the golden age. <laughs> Maybe the golden age yeah. of Tom Tom Hanks on vinyl. Yeah. I Tom that song Hanks is so records. good. Maybe the best song that the Fountains of Wayne guy ever wrote. Uh but Oh yeah, yeah. Adam Schlesinger, yeah. Yeah, so uh, so so good. So I'm just excited to be plugging other people's records that are <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, if you're listening to this and you haven't listened to Dead Eyes, genuinely one of my favorite podcasts ever. Uh, I, I loved it. I I came to it late too, which was kind of nice actually, because then I got to kind of just listen to it all. You know, I, I but it was great because I I came on board kind of like right before season three. So I still didn't know that like you were going to end up landing Tom. I, I was so it was like in this great place where it was like I could binge it, but I was still in the dark for almost the whole time. It was only I think I was like maybe had five episodes left and I sort of heard online that you had landed Tom or whatever, but it was still like a nice like, oh, is he going to get him? But also I can listen to all these without having to wait a week all the time. So, yeah, it was it's such a great show. And if you haven't listened to it, it's, it's really fantastic. 
That sort of is the ideal way to experience a series as a combo of binge. and Like when you discover a series right before its final season comes out, that you kind of get to catch up with everybody else without any of the waiting. And then you get to experience the real time excitement of the end of a show. Yes, it was. It was awesome. To say the end of a show in the sense that I, I always leave the door open. I fully intended to keep Dead Eyes going beyond uh, the Tom Hanks interview because I felt like there were other. I do have specific ideas for other Dead Eyes episodes. I just haven't been able to make them happen. Right. Uh, well, I don't I'm want saying to come right back. here, right now, if I have any influence at all, Headgum, whatever, make it happen. <laughs> Headgum is is totally down. It's totally down to me being able. I don't want to bring it back and have it be a shadow of what it was sure it for it to come back there has to be a good reason it can't just be like i'm ba- like i wouldn't come back and keep talking about band of brothers like that <laughs> that we've had tom but i've also that, thought about a few <laughs> other things since that guy's been on yeah but i i think thematically there are way i can imagine a version of it that would have like a colon at the end of the title that would be like it's because there are most of the first three seasons of dead eyes or me changing the subject in some ways or kind of go veering off in another direction. And I had a lot more ideas for episodes that would have fit within that template. Some of them are just hard to realize because they require um, booking a specific guest. That's hard to get. And I don't want to make a season about, I don't want my thing to be like, I'm a, the, the celebrity version of like a, those people who chase tornadoes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't want to be like, you know, Connor's back and there's some other celebrity that he's going to like uh, pursue until they talk to him. You know, uh, that's sort of like a one and done in terms of like, I'll either be able to book the people I'm able to book for it or it won't happen. You know, right. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see if more stuff happens. You can follow Connor on Twitter and Instagram at Connor Ratliff. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Block Party Pod. You can donate to the show at patreon.com slash block party. If you want to see the video of this episode, it's on our YouTube, youtube.com slash at block party. Thank you so much for listening. We love you and appreciate you. We'll see you back here next week. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>